Welcome once again. Before we begin, I'd like to say that the EPIC program and UCLA acknowledges our presence in the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino and Tongva peoples. Welcome again on this Friday afternoon. My name is Lisa Felipe. I am the director of the EPIC program. We are excited for you to join us today because we are going to talk a little bit about what's next for EPIC, um, specifically our language initiatives. Um, however, we do have a few things that we're launching um, this, this quarter and then up until the fall. We've had already um, some emails. Hopefully you've, you've received them in your inboxes. If not, you will, uh, you will see them soon. So some of the things that um, is coming out of the, the, the pipeline, uh, actually David McFadden is going to talk with us about. Um, but let me just first introduce all of the folks that you're seeing on the screen right now. I'm again, Lisa Felipe, the director of EPIC. We have Gyana Mahajan, who is our co-faculty director um, of EPIC as well, and uh, David McFadden, who is another co-faculty director for EPIC, um, and then David Skaberg. And, and uh, Gyana will introduce David um, uh, as well, uh, our, our Dean of Humanities. So thank you again, and I will kick it up to David, who David McFadden, I should say, uh, to uh, introduce some of the upcoming initiatives for EPIC. Thank you very much, Lisa. And uh, as you noted, I'm part of the EPIC team. Uh, my home department's Complet, but I'm also in musicology and digital humanities. But initially I began in Russian studies, so I've taught plenty of language classes in my time, and I'm fully aware of what an intellectual and professional and um, psychological challenge it can be teaching languages, um, perhaps even more so when it's outside the, the Latin alphabet. So I'm in spirit, I'm very much with you. In terms of what's coming, some of you, I would imagine the majority of you know a little bit about the work that um, Epic did over the last couple of years. And we're building on that tradition, primarily through uh, new and uh, unique different um, STEs or seminars in teaching excellence. So as Lisa, Lisa mentioned, there's information in your, uh, hopefully in your inboxes, certainly around all the departments already regarding new opportunities to work on uh, curricular development. Uh, in terms of uh, other STEs, we have um, several, a handful that are built around the, uh, what we like to think of as experimental humanities. So digital and health and environmental, et cetera, et cetera, in order that we can work um, not, not only between departments, but also outside of the division as well. So in terms of health humanities, which is what I'm doing, I'm working with the med school. So it's a combination of skills, what we can do and, and what they can do. So we have the opportunity to work together in funded, um, very well funded, uh, small groups, uh, which are not hierarchically designed. People come in as peers and discuss together how they might want to, for example, build a syllabus that they could use in one of those uh, areas. Um, then we also have a new collaboration with SEALS, which in, in, in brief terms is the uh, teacher training or pedagogical arm of uh, South Campus. And they have such stellar teacher training um, structures in place that we want to work with them so that we can benefit from them, um, in a sense, piggybacking on their expertise, but simultaneously honing it for our own students. So that's a collaboration that's also brand new. And then we also have Parasol, P-A-R-O-S-L, which is a peer, um, uh, what should we call it? Um, I should know, it's my wife that does it. Um, it is a opportunity for faculty uh, to come together in pairs. So these are friends and colleagues. So there's no sense of judgment. There's no sense of, um, once again, hierarchical, hierarchical relationships spoiling that working pair but you decide together on two innovations that you might each, so one each, two innovations that you might want to bring to your teaching. So let's say somebody from classics could work with somebody from Spanish because they can understand each, each other's classes when they visit them. And then together they figure out what innovation would work for them best. They then go back to the class and they um, apply it and come back again with the, the pedagogical or educational expert in order 
uh, in that very sort of stress-free environment to build something into their classes that will make them pedagogically up to date, but also uh, more attractive to students because there's these opportunities and these skill sets change each and every year. So there's plenty going on. Please check out our website. As I mentioned, uh, we do fund a lot of these opportunities. So it's a great chance not only to spend your time on something that will benefit you, your department and your students, but we're also paying to make it slightly easier for you to attend um, one of our groups. But we all work completely on a horizontal basis. We're all on, all on an equal footing here in our leadership team. And when you join any of our activities, nobody is judging. Everybody comes in together learns together and benefits on the same same term so it's a profoundly democratic structure from beginning to end that's all i have to say please do check out the website um, and in the meantime i'll hand it over to big david who will tell you more about what's happening at the the division i'm just, I'm just a very, mi very minor character in game of thrones I'm, I'm oh, great. Behind a tree. Well, sometimes when i'm in epic settings i think of the great dr seuss story too many daves in which uh, there are actually right, 21 right. daves in the scene right. um, i'm really glad to be here i'm very happy about the um positive response we've had from the mellon foundation in the past few months to um a slight readjusting of how we're handling programming in epic and i'm very very happy that part of the focus is going to be on language uh, learning, language, language teaching and learning. Um, I am a closet language teacher. Um, in my early years living overseas, I supported myself by teaching English in, in Taiwan for three years and in Japan for a year. Uh, I did that with a certain amount of training, but without a great deal of expertise. Um, I, I did do it with extraordinary pleasure. It was a, it was a joy. And I'm, quite certain that that experience informed my later approach both to teaching at UCLA and my approach to research actually um, in so many ways the business of teaching someone how to how to say you know hello may I have a cup of coffee in another language is uh, deeply related to the business of teaching someone how to speak intelligently about any other subject whether in our own language or in a second language. I really believe that part of what we're doing as we're training people in thought or inviting people to train themselves in thought is giving examples of language, rewarding examples of certain kind of language. So I see a real continuity between what the best language teachers do and what anyone who's trying to teach anything is doing. <clears throat> uh, I also want to report um, and I think I've mentioned this to the many friends and and, um, and close colleagues there are on this call. Uh, I want to mention that when I'm reading dossiers out of the division, when I'm reading about the work that people do in their classrooms, very consistently, the work of language instructors, the work of writing instructors, that is the work of people who are intervening most directly with with the workings of our students' minds, if I can put it that way, the expression of the workings of their minds on paper. Um, it's these instructors who are working hardest and in many cases having the biggest effects on, uh, on, on, on our students. Um, and I think you've read, you've read your own evaluations and you know that occasionally in, in those letters from students, you see amazing things, the student who, for the first time dares to speak with his father in Farsi, for example, just just one thing from my recollection. Um, the conversation I had with a student who in one of our language classes on campus had learned that the weird thing going on between her parents when they spoke Spanish had to do with the way that Mexican Spanish was regarded as against uh, Salvadorian Spanish and the student's experience was one of discovering the dignity of her mother's native language and of being able to communicate with her in new ways. And of course, um, these kinds of connections of heritage, connection, connections of generation are among the most moving kinds of things that come, can come out of language teaching. But the, the more general access to the other parts of the world, to the past, are crucial to a humanities education. I think we're also in the position of showing people the strength of their own minds the possibility of reforming your mind around an entirely new operating 
language, learning to think or even to dream in another language is an experience that we provide at UCLA. Um, doesn't happen with everyone, doesn't happen with the students who are dropping in just to get their language requirement out of the way, but it does happen. You are involved in helping start people off on an intellectual life in which they recognize their own powers. And again, I, I speak from my own experience as a language learner, right? the business of learning Chinese and not learning it perfectly ever, <laughs> giving it a, a lifelong effort has been a constant way of checking in on whether my brain is working properly. And I think we're always doing that with our students. So I think I'm here to express a kind of general solidarity with language teaching. UCLA should be proud of the range of, of languages we teach, of the expertise with which you teach those languages. And I think we should, be, we should be very proud to have attracted the support of the Mellon Foundation in doubling down on language pedagogy. If this is the place where we meet our students and where we interact with them in some of the most intense ways, this is the place where we need to be setting example of teaching at the top of our game. And I do, I do think that um, the expertise and dedication that you bring into your classrooms tends to affect the people around you in departments. I think it raises the bar for anyone who's teaching anything. I still teach language, I teach classical, language, classical Chinese when I teach. Um, but when I do it, I'm aware that, you know, Michelle Smith is out there teaching well in, in modern Chinese and people around me are teaching very well, you know, Hansko is teaching well in, in Japanese. There are examples of superb language teaching going on all around me. And that means that uh, the way I come into the classroom as a classical Chinese teacher has to be very serious to me. I'm really grateful to Dr. Gyanam Mahajan for leading the, the epic Lang part of this. She and I have talked about how language teaching and how a really forward-looking approach to language pedagogy can be part of the humanities divisions curricula. We've been talking about this for years as colleagues in ALC and as colleagues in, in the division of humanities. And so I'm glad that, that, that language has emerged as such a central part of epic right now. And I see it as you know, quite nicely connected with the other aspect of that, the experimental humanities aspect that David was mentioning. And of course, I see it as just continual reinforcement of our fundamental caring for our students, our conviction that if we are going to do our best jobs as faculty members, as instructors, that means continually learning how to do even better for our students. And I know that spirit is, is here in this, this Zoom space and, and it's here on campus when we're, when we're on campus. So thank you and um, I'm really happy to have had this opportunity to come and, and um, rant on a little bit about how important I think this project is. So thank you. Thank you very much. And, yes, oh, and, and thank you to the whole EPIC team for making this possible, thank you. I was just going to say that. Thank you, uh, David. Actually, you've uh, you know put everything in place so that David and I can step in and now play around with it, and you and Lisa. And I would like to introduce the other uh, team members. Our coordinator is Tegan. Uh, Tegan, if you could wave. And uh, we have our GSR with us, uh, Anne, who joined us uh, this year. Uh, all, we're a, uh, well, I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, but we're a great team. It certainly feels great uh, to be working together. Um, and today, uh, you know, after a uh, minor uh, rearrangement of uh, Epic uh, with Melon, uh, we're ready to uh, uh, launch this language section. Um, been wondering what to call it, ended up with just simple epic lang. Um, if, if you want a better name, let me know. Um, and just welcoming everybody. I like this slide also because uh, the typography, right? Uh, linguistic landscape with uh, so many, uh, not just languages, but different scripts also uh, there. Um, so here are some main features of uh, our uh, Epic Lang uh, 
program. And what we are hoping for is, you know, some transformative language pedagogy, which is uh, inclusive and innovative, which is the focus of our EPIC uh, program. Uh, effective teaching, which meets the goals of a humanities curriculum. So you should be able to get more than just the target language. Uh, you should be able to do more than ask for a cup of coffee. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, and, uh, you know, we, we want to set up language courses that are meaningful and relevant to a diverse set of students because we seem to notice that the uh, needs of the students are constantly changing and our student population is changing. They are themselves far more uh, multilingual and multicultural. So how can we use them as a resource and uh, at the same time expand their uh, horizons? So uh, just trying to be adaptive and uh, evolving. Um, we want to keep our teaching transparent and be able to co-opt the students, uh, you know, again, in order to meet their uh, needs. Um, we want to engage in cultures and languages across the curriculum. You, many of you must be familiar with this. It is often referred to as uh, CLAC, C-L-A-C. Uh, um, but of course, we want to target it to, or adapt it or mold it to uh, requirements of uh, at UCLA and our community colleges around us. Um, and uh, I mean, ideally, we'd like to provide global learning experience locally. I, I think that's the ultimate goal of a language course, right? Um, our foci will be, you know, we're focused on the learning outcomes and goals so that just making it clear that we don't have a, you know, one size fits all. There are different languages. There are different features to languages and language families. Um, there are different needs uh, to be met, different things to uh, focus on. So we're, we're focused on the learning outcomes and goals rather than particular fixed structures. Um, and they should be adapted again, depending on the language and language area. And as uh, uh, David McFadden mentioned, you know, uh, depending on whether you're using a different uh, script or not, there might be a difference between oral oral skills and reading writing skills. Uh, and, and so uh, we want to provide a flexible uh, approach. Um, we, we would, I try to think of dividing up language uh, teaching or pedagogy in terms of the instruction, the practical aspects, the content, the curriculum, the syllabi, uh, and then the assessment or a better word that I like is progress indicators or setting up some progress monitors because in a, uh, according to me, uh, language and culture uh, classes, not everything can be or should be assessed. Um, and we need to get beyond simply figuring out uh, grades, right? And I know it's a difficult thing to do because no matter what we may like to do, the students are focused so much on the grade part of it that we need to think about how to engage them in overall learning rather than uh, fixating on grades. You know, it's not their fault. Uh, it's important in their lives. Um, and finally, uh, when we were uh, writing our proposal uh, to Mellon, this part of it, I was focusing more on how to, uh, how can language um, colleagues collaborate? How can they mentor, you know, others, the, the young ones or the new, uh, uh, the younger faculty, you know, I think of in terms of like old guard and new guard, right? So many of us are old guard. And as David said, you know, we're not, it's a pretty flat structure. Uh, 
but yes, some of us are uh, older at this game. So uh, sharing with not just younger um, uh, language faculty, but also uh, TAs uh, and uh, graduate students as they prepare to enter the uh, you know, professional world, are we equipping, equipping them with enough uh, knowledge about language pedagogy, which is increasingly going to be very important, uh, already is. Um, so here is what we have put into our uh, Epic Lang. Uh, we have some workshops and uh, training uh, coming up over the next two years. These include uh, workshops and training for professional development, uh, for example, on the uh, proficiency skills, language proficiency skills, or, you know, OPI training and certification, or world readiness standards, and, uh, of course, linking it up to um, how do you incorporate these into your curriculum. Uh, we're always focused on that part of it. Um, we will have uh, invited speakers uh, on new and exciting uh, topics of interest. And uh, later on, uh, we will uh, ask for suggestions. And after the event, we will send out a, um, a questionnaire and uh, we welcome suggestions on uh, who would you like to invite uh, to listen on what topic? Um, we will be proposing collaborative projects and, uh, you know, setting up meetings for sharing best practices. Um, we have a, uh, a part of the um, Epic Lang portion focused on materials development, because oftentimes uh, many of us, um, you know, work on something and then someone else is reinventing the wheel and doing exactly the same thing. So instead we will uh, work together, but then we will create a repository where we can uh, post these things, make it readily accessible to everyone. Um, we would like to create templates, uh, you know, for example, uh, we are collaborating with SEALS and SEALS has an excellent uh, EDI based uh, syllabus template. And now all we need to do, all we need to do is, uh, uh, you know, adapt it or modify it to suit language teaching. Uh, and, and so, once we generate a uh, inclusive or transparent syllabus that uh, has portions that can be where you can co-opt students and includes CLAC, uh, cultures and languages across the curriculum, then you know it, it can easily be adapted to different uh, languages and different language teachers uh, and um, graduate students and TAs can also get a sense of how to be part of the course instead of, you know, handling just the Friday sections or something like that. So that everybody is working in sync uh, together. Um, and uh, uh, we are also restarting the language materials project. I don't know if you uh, all remember the LMP, which was housed in the Center for, for World Languages, still is there. However, it is inactive. So um, this summer, uh, starting from this summer, we will be reactivating the Language Materials Project. And in addition, as I mentioned, we will uh, create a repository for work that we do uh, so that we can file it in one place and is, uh, it acts like a clearinghouse or, you know, uh, something where you can just drop by and pick something that suits you, but always adapt it and use it to uh, suit your needs, right? Finally, we do have some um, 
grants uh, coming up and uh, these uh, grants will be preceded by some um, some training workshops. Uh, for example, we would like to provide some training um, in uh, you know, topics that are slightly more content-based so that we are able to do language across curriculum. Uh, so we will uh, perhaps talk about language typology or groups of languages or learning of uh, new orthographies, what are the steps involved, um, or uh, even uh, collaborating with um, content faculty, for lack of a better word, uh, on um, uh, setting up maybe language sections to a content course so that a uh, content faculty is working with a language faculty member and creating these innovative uh, courses um, or how to talk about uh, culture in a meaningful way in your classes. Uh, and we will be uh, looking at the um, AACU, uh, Association of American Colleges and Universities who have proposed these value rubric. Some of you might have attended a talk by Professor Ben Rifkin, and he uh, mentioned uh, these uh, rubrics. And as an EPIC uh, team, we've been looking at that. And so we will try and uh, propose ways to incorporate this in our uh, teaching.